I want to preface this video by saying that my friend wrote to me this morning and said that he's a friend of Christine's. And after this whole fallout online during Thanksgiving break, he had a letter that he wondered if he could have posted on my Casual Magic Facebook page. And I said I was more than willing to do that. But in a way, I also felt that it deserved a video to at least have another way to get his words out there. And I'm sorry this isn't a Morgan Freeman voiceover, but I'll try my best. So the following is my friend's letter to the Magic community. In approximately six weeks from now, Magic the Gathering will celebrate its silver anniversary. Believe it or not, I've been playing nearly as long. Yeah, I'm one of those people that wishes he had a DeLorean to be able to purchase cases and sets of Alpha and Beta. I picked up my first revised deck the summer after I graduated, in old 1994. Days later, I attempted to sit down and learn the game, but as soon as the person sitting across the table from me explained the concept of anti to me, even before the concept of tapping lands for mana, I was out the door. Those cards sat in my college dorm room until the next summer, when I was hired at that same exact store to sell comic books. My, at the time, current love. However, on day two, I was informed that if I wanted success in the job, I would have to learn how to play Magic. A year removed from my initial experience, I complied. My Magic experience in a nutshell. Learn to play, organize small tournaments for the store, discovered the playgroup at the local Barnes & Noble Cafe, left job at the comic shop in 1998, began organizing my own tournaments at other shops, gave up on the shops to organize tournaments and regular gaming at a local church, turned events at this church into a non-profit organization, won Wizards of the Coast sponsored event entitled My Magic Story in 2010 and fell in love with Puerto Rico. While in Puerto Rico, I befriended several Wizards of the Coast employees. In November of 2013, the burdens of organizing a non-profit took their toll and I closed the doors. Now I just enjoy playing at my local game store. That's my story in a very compact form. The backstory is necessary to set the stage for some very open and honest opinions about this community that I've been a part of for so long. It all goes back to that very first seat at the very first table. It was so important for this guy to explain the concept of ante, which, of course, is no longer acceptable. It was enough to put me off. After all, I only had one starter deck, which at the time contained only 60 cards. Losing my very first game would mean my deck would be illegal, forcing me to purchase more cards. A retailer's dream, but a noob's nightmare. Yeah, there was a brief pause for thought when my boss, Brian, instructed me a year later about my newfound responsibility to learn the game to be able to sell it. Learning to play, however, was only the beginning. I would eventually be sorting, pricing, and selling cards, answering ruling questions, judging small shop tournaments on paper, etc. The challenges started practically on day one. Judge! Yeah, that was me. I wasn't very good, but I was all we had. And since it was just me making all the decisions, I heard all the frustrations. I don't agree with your ruling. Why can't we start yet? The complaints and questions only blossomed from there. As I moved on in my magic life, the challenges evolved. Over time, everyone had their own opinion about start times, card rulings, cheating, etc., etc. In a town that makes Cap'n Crunch at the Quaker plant that's just down the street from our very games of magic, we have lots of railroad crossings for the delivery of corn and such. Why do I say this? Because now and then, trains block our streets for 10 to 15 minutes at a time. And when that happens, Dan is late to unlock the doors of the church. Kids who live on that side of town, however, just look at their watches in disgust because now their tournament is starting five minutes later than they wanted. And so the evening begins. And so Dan's life as a magic organizer begins. We had a free space to play that wasn't a store. We had an organizer relationship with Wizards of the Coast. We needed a name. Central Corridor Gamers, CCG. In 2009, we were officially a non-profit doing charity work for our community. Not even catastrophic floods would disband the group and our loyalty to the group and the game we so dearly loved. But I'm not writing about all my experiences as an organizer, although I'm sure I could tell stories for years. Stories like the one about the regulars we had at our monthly tournaments that would demand intentional draws before there were rules about whether or not intentional draws were legal. Of course, if I told them that they would have to play it out, I was in the wrong. But the people that would get shoved out of the top eight because of their intentional draws would come to me swearing with disapproval. 
Situations like this had me hated by members of our local magic community, by people on both sides of situations, just like the one I mentioned. And people I didn't even know would hear stories from these people that felt wrong by my decisions, and not just to avoid our events, but they would outwardly encourage others from attending. For years, this sort of talk would go on. Believe it or not, this was even before social media. Seriously. Before the quagmire of vitriol called Facebook, I was already known as the scum of the earth. I can't imagine how big organizers do it these days. I imagine medicine chests full of antidepressants and headphones emitting the sounds of calm blue oceans. Not me. In 2013, I was out of organizer energy. It was the time to be done. I had other ambitions. Years of leadership within our magic group led me to believe that I was capable of so much more. Thoughts of running for city council had me at a fork in the road. The thing about this fork in the road, however, was that one path was full of bumps in the road and thorns in my path. The other was a dark path, but it appeared to be a much smoother one. My decision was based on what the group's mainstay regulars, or board members, would say about me and my ambitions. I had no doubt that they would have words of encouragement and support, which is, of course, what I received. The decision was made and the path was clear. If I were to make an honest run at city council, my nearly everyday duties with CCG would have to be reduced. Someone else could write press releases about events. Someone else could schedule events with Wizards of the Coast. Someone else could pick up the draft product from our affiliated store. And so they did. One month. That's how much time the guys had to step it up and keep the doors from closing. So for a month, they carried the torch. I had passed them my torch, one that had been lit for nearly two decades now. But with a torch, one requires fuel. Over the course of that last month in 2013, the fuel was quickly running out. When the fuel ran out, the flame died. They dropped my torch. So when I announced our last day as a group, I was threatened and had to lock myself in the building. One of our longest standing regulars, who never did follow through with any promises to help out, was threatening to beat my ass when I got into the parking lot. It took another long-standing regular to talk him out of it. And just like that, nearly two decades of being an organizer of a gaming group turned nonprofit. the doors were closed. Please allow me to clarify momentarily. A couple other long-standing regulars attempted to keep things going with me banned from their new group, but they quickly discovered that they couldn't handle it. Two weeks. That's all it took for people to understand how challenging it is to herd cats in our local magic community. Fast forward four years. There are four years worth of stories that I'll tell at a later time. In recent years, I've had the opportunity to meet Magic's pioneer cosplay artist, Christine Sprankle. My wife and I even had the pleasure of introducing her to our good friends at Ultra Pro International, who enjoyed her presence at their Gen Con booth the following year. She offered people photo opportunities and help with the annual charity project. Since that first meeting with Christine, my wife and I have watched her growth from afar, from Gen Con to Grand Prix tournaments, all the way to large-scale events, such as Magic Pro Tours and a headliner at the very first HasCon. Christine has truly climbed her way to the top of her game, no pun intended. Unbeknownst to us, there's been an unseen dark side. Now, maybe I'm just an ostrich with his head in the sand these days, but when Christine announced, via Twitter at C. Sprankle, on November 25th that she was quitting Magic, we were floored. Should we have been surprised? In this post-Weinstein world? Of course not. I was quick to jump to the internet to find out why someone so respected and loved in the Magic community would just up and quit. And not only did she quit the game of Magic, but she quit the thing that brought her the fame that she so rightly deserved. Cosplay. I can only imagine the barrage of private messages, texts, and various other well wishes when someone of such stature in such a large community can just up and quit not just the one thing that she loved, but two. Some of these notes were from a very respected and notable figure in the magic community, Steve Argyle. As I've had the pleasure of working with both Christine and Steve for Ultra Pro's charity project, I know that they have a great friendship. They make it very clear on social media that they are very good friends. They inspire each other. Through Mr. Argyle, it came to my attention that Christine has experienced a good amount of harassment of all sorts through online means and otherwise. I've yet to see some of it myself because I can only imagine how infuriated I would become if I read some of these words. And in these days of hearing the words of Harvey Weinstein, Kevin Spacey, Senator Al Franken, etc., very clearly from their victims, one doesn't need much imagination to get an idea of the things that were said to Christine. And if you take th those words and put an angry magic player's spin on them, 
we're not talking about heads and gutters. We're talking about taking that gutter all the way to the sewer. To sum it all up, in my 22 years of experience playing and organizing magic, I've come across my fair share of scumbags, jerks, thieves, liars, crooks, and downright horrible people. Every interaction I've personally had with any of these people have given me pause for thought. Most of those pauses have been brief and not worth the headspace. However, there have been a number of pauses that forced me to think of every possible reaction. From calling authorities, to ending friendships, to possibly even quitting the game of magic altogether, I've spent significant headspace on all of the above. Conversely, there are the experiences that make me value each minute I've spent on this game and the opportunities it has provided me with. I cannot discount the lifelong friendships that were created by Wizards event reporters sitting me across the table from a kind, caring individual. Projects have come from my CCG involvement that have changed my life and the lives of others. Charity projects like Costumes for Kids and Games for Troops were so very important not only for our local community, but for my own soul. Some of these projects have even led to my personal relationship with Ultra Pro International and the charity work that we do every year at Gen Con. At this time of year, when my wife and I look back at what we've accomplished together, one of the brightest highlights is always the work that we did at Gen Con and the difference we made for kids involved with Make-A-Wish, the relieving organization for the money we raise. But then situations like this arise. I hang my head in shame and that bright light that is our work at Gen Con, for example, is diminished by the cloud of hate and vitriol that the magic community is so good at creating and fostering. It's time to take a stand and make a change. It's time to create an inviting atmosphere instead of one that is toxic. As women are finally, willingly, joining up with what was for so long a male-dominated community, it's imperative that change be made yesterday. Many of us veterans now have daughters that are old enough to wonder where dad disappears to once a week. They're interested in digging out dad's old duels and slinging cards with their male counterparts. As a father of daughters, I know that if my daughter were treated the way that Christine's been treated, I would personally bring the wrath of God down on the scumbag that wronged my little girl. Guys, we have always had a responsibility to be respectful of the ladies we encounter on a daily basis. But now it's the time to be more mindful than ever. Be more respectful than ever. But you know what? As I type this line about being respectful to girls, it hit me. This isn't just about sexual harassment or anti-feminism. This is simply about respecting one another, guys and girls alike. We're all human beings and none of us deserve to receive the treatment that goes on daily, both in and outside of the magic community. In closing, I hope that by reading this, you're clearly aware of how awful the magic community can treat people. How awful it's treated people for years, in person, behind one another's backs, and online. It's time that we put these offenders in their place. Even if Wizards of the Coast, for some strange reason, does nothing to rectify the situation or help prevent future altercations, at least some of us will be out here making an effort to affect positive change. It's sad that we have to say these things in regards to our time spent playing a game.